So, um, so today I am so um, excited about being here uh, with you all uh, to talk to you uh, about a topic that really is very dear to my heart, uh, which is talking about how we can look at diversity, equity, and inclusion within organizations um, using what uh, I have uh, come to appreciate in terms of organizational change frameworks, appreciative inquiry. Um, so I'm going to get started today. I, I have two cases that I'd like to talk to you about uh, in terms of um, how diversity and equity and inclusion happened in these two organizations using appreciative inquiry. But first, I want to just tell you a little bit about my intention for the day. So let's just go to the next slide. So I want to discuss a little bit about appreciative inquiry framework. You may already know something about this, but I do want to introduce some of those tenants. Um, and then uh, talk about creating an awareness of appreciative inquiry application in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Um, this is going to be a little bit different from the traditional model, right? And I want you to try to consider all the things that we can use in terms of uh, DEI that would be helpful outside of the traditional model. And then apply appreciative inquiry tenants, um, really looking at your DEI strategic goals. Okay, I'm clicking, but it's not going. Is it going there? Okay, good. All right. So the first thing I'd like to just talk about is our current state in terms of the DEI space. Um, currently, we're looking at uh, really organizations uh, using a traditional framework in terms of where they're going, meaning they're doing trainings, mostly. Uh, inspirational speaking, sometimes, right? Um, very seldom do you see them go, so to speak, outside the box to really look at DEI and, and how they can really infuse this into the culture of the organization, right? Um, timing, hmm. Uh, a lot of times we, uh, and we see that we have this whole change in our society and we're really looking at now um, how we can have equity, diversity, and inclusion in our workspaces, in our lives, really. Uh, and that it needs to be done right now. And then the resources, what are the resources that we are actually putting toward the DEI um, and that DEI space? A lot of times we see now that folks are hiring uh, different people in their organizations so that they can really look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in those spaces uh, in a traditional way, I would say. But when we look at the future state, the why, the how, the when of where are we going with diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know a lot of times you hear a lot about uh, the business case for it. Uh, sometimes we hear about the moral case for it. Um, oftentimes those are the only two things that we hear and we hear it again from a traditional model. The how again, mostly has been training and the when again, kind of up in the air, we think that we need to do it on an annual basis. We think that we need to monitor it. We're not quite sure how uh, to monitor it. So there's a lot of questions, I will say, um, as we move forward with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I would like to think that we would look at it in terms of bridging the gap using not just the traditional model, but also using a model um, that actually can forge this way forward that we need. Uh, in a positive manner. And this is aside from training. Um, this is aside from inspiration and inspirational speakers only. So appreciative inquiry really is an asset-based approach to organizational and social engagement that utilizes questions and dialogue to help participants uncover existing strengths, advantages, or opportunities in their communities and in their organizations, even with their teams. Uh, appreciative inquiry is a model that seeks to engage stakeholders in a self-determined change. This cultural divide that I'm talking about really is a virtual barrier. It's, it's caused by cultural differences that really hinder our interactions, uh, hinder us from having harmonious discussions. Uh, and really because why you know, differences, the differences between how we see things uh, as people, individuals, uh, and as a culture, right, as groups. So I'm gonna do something that I'm gonna tell you that I shouldn't have done it. So I wanna tell you about, um, you already know this, 
that diversity really, there's a business reason why we should have diverse teams. We talk about in terms of revenue, increased diversity leads to increased profits. That's from the Boston Consulting Group from Harvard. They tell us about how teams, more diverse companies have higher success rates. Um, some of those same type of studies telling us about innovation and creati creativity being increased. Um, diverse teams make better decisions, they tell us. Um, so we all have heard about this business reason uh, for us to actually do what we need to do in terms of diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. But I'm going to say this, and I really, really appreciate this saying by Sheryl Sandberg, and that's that we need to resist the tyranny of low expectations. And what I mean by that is counting numbers, how many women, how many Black people, how many Hispanic people that we have on our teams, um, looking at everything from a quantitative state and not really looking at how can we create environments where people, all people can grow, all people can have joy in that environment, all people can be included in that environment, looking at it from the standpoint of bringing all of us together so that we can co-create the environment that we're in and not just looking at numbers. I'm not saying numbers don't matter. What I'm saying is we can have a bigger vision for what it is that we want to see um, in our lives, also a bigger vision in what we want to see in our workplaces. So this is what I hear a lot. You know, didn't we do the training? That kind of becomes the answer to the checkbox that we looked at uh, DEI. Um, Again, we, we bring in inspirational speakers, we raise awareness, uh, but we're less enthusiastic or most companies are less enthusiastic about long-term interventions that can be done. Uh, a shift in the balance of power and resources, reimagining um, their personnel processes, uh, evaluations, promotions, conflict resolutions. And so regardless of what intervention actually works, um, they're really not looking to find that particular thing, but actually they're looking at checking a box. And so we get, I think we've been trained on that. And these are things that have been told to me. I don't know why we have to do this over again. I don't know why we have to look at this again, because we've all been um, trained. Right? I get comments like, I don't know why we're bringing in these extra people. I'm not a racist. People not really knowing what diversity, equity, and inclusion entails, not really knowing about in institutional racism and how it's bringing them down. I mean, everyone, not just, not just black, black and brown people, but the whole company in general is missing out. Not just on what I just told you about in terms of innovation and in terms of creativity and in terms of uh, the financial status, but they're missing out on the experience the experience of having a diverse, equitable, and inclusive uh, environment, right? Where everybody is valued. They're missing out on that dream, on that experience. So let's look at how we usually do things. So for the most part, even with diversity, equity, and inclusion, you'll see that we, we try to use the same way we, problem solving, the same way that we always use problem solving. So there's a difference between things that are complicated and things that are complex. So let me explain. So complicated problems can be hard to solve, but they're generally addressable with rules and recipes and regulations like uh, an algorithm that you try to put, you know, uh, or steps for you to put something on your Twitter feed. By the way, I still can't do that, but, but it has steps in it. it. It might be hard to someone, but it has steps in it. So the solutions to a complicated problems usually don't work as well with complex problems. Uh, complex problems have too many unknowns, uh, too many interrelated factors to reduce down to just rules and, and processes. So that's equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, that's the things we don't talk about at work, politics and religion, that type stuff. So those things have lots of inputs and lots of outputs. But what we find is that oftentimes what we will be doing and what we do do um, is we use our default, which is to constantly solve problems, to constantly stay in the negative, 
it's kind of what we do seriously all the time uh, with ourselves, with our teams, with our organizations. We are constantly playing whack-a-mole with solving problems. Now, I will say this. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a registered nurse. Uh, I'm a lawyer, of course. Uh, there are some things that um, are complicated where there's just a few inputs or one input and one output, and we need to use that. We use root cause analysis, right, all the time. So that's okay. So I'm not saying that, that we never should use that, but for complex issues like equity, diversity, and inclusion, we really need to look at a solution that takes into account all the different areas and interrelatedness of things that we have to deal with. So, so seriously, looking at something that is complex is different than looking for something that is complicated. So when we go to our default and we problem solve, we look at the problem, we analyze the cause, uh, there's an analysis of a possible solution, we come up with an action plan, and then that's the end of the problem, the problem is solved, right? So that's actually something that we can't do with equity, diversity, and inclusion. Oftentimes it's what I call a moving target because times change, people change, events and environments change. Organisms, or I should say organizations are living organisms, things change. So with things constantly evolving, um, you actually need a way of looking at these particular issues that can evolve with the issue. And so that really is appreciative inquiry. So in appreciative inquiry, we look at uh, what is the current state in terms of, get this, value. Oftentimes I go into organizations and they say to me, especially when we're working on DEI or any type of thing about anything about culture, um, they're like, what do you, we don't, we don't like the current state. What do you mean? Let's talk about the current state. And so I immediately have to move them from the negative thoughts. And guys, I'm not even talking about them in a derogatory neck way. We all move toward negativity. That's kind of like a human condition. So for us to switch to positivity, we actually have to have intention to do that. So I'm always moving my clients from saying negative things to saying positive things. So when I'm talking about the value of what is, I'm talking about what is it that do do right? I know that we think sometimes, especially with diversity, equity, inclusion, we're not doing anything right. But that, that's actually not true. And, and when I bring in these cases, I, I, I want to talk to you about that and how I had a chance to kind of bring these organizations to what they were doing right and how they could spread that. Uh, envisioning what might be. Again, I think it hinders us when we constantly train people, but they really don't know where they're going. What is the end goal of the training? What are we trying to do as an organization? Um, and I will say this too. Oftentimes, the metrics that we use to measure um, DEI is how many people took the training. But when you think about that, how many people took the training, does that really say that it's a better work environment? How are we measuring these things? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So envisioning what might be, what is the vision that everybody has for the particular environment we're talking about? Dialogue about what should be, what's expected of us in terms of society and the world in general. Innovate and create what will be. What do we all want? And then now we have this infinite capacity to really grow and monitor. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do with our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I say this too, again, remember, equity, diversity, and inclusion is not a problem to be solved. This is something that's happening within our culture, again, that will be constantly evolving. And we have to constantly adapt to what is going on. And so our current traditional problem-solving method actually oftentimes really falls short. So general guiding principles of appreciative inquiry, when I go in to talk to my clients, focus on the positive as a core value. Um, again, that's usually not, <laughs> not really met with people look at me like, what are you talking about? That we, we brought you here because there's something wrong, right? What's, what's positive? So having to switch their minds to the positive. But then to inquire into stories 
of these life-giving forces that are occurring within your organization. Sometimes we don't know. And, and most of the time we don't know because we haven't really talked to the people who are living their lives within the organization. Um, select themes from the stories and select topics from those themes for further inquiry. Um, I move on with my clients to create shared images for a preferred future. And then we talk about innovativeness, how to innovate ways to get to where it is that we've all decided that we need to be. So um, I had two stories and I was thinking to myself, I'll just tell them the story about the organization, but I can't, I have to tell you the story too about the church uh, that I was working with. But so just to start off with this one, this is a organization, um, industrial organization that um, and this particular industry does lean toward males and male products and what have you. They had gotten several EPO claims. As a lawyer, I was um, working on EPO claims with this particular insurance company. Um, part of my job was to mitigate these claims uh, in terms of going out to help our clients uh, whatever way I could um, to assist them with not getting more EPO claims. Uh, and that's employment claims is what I'm talking about. Um, in specific, they were having claims against them that they were hiring males and not enough females. Um, so we're sent into this company. Um, I had only been trained, I don't know, maybe a month or so with appreciative inquiry. I didn't really know a whole, whole lot about it. Um, I was traveling with my cohort. We went in to talk to them. Um, this is basically what they said their problem was. This is a pretty good statement too. The organization has a male dominated leadership framework because of historical and ingrained beliefs that defined the cultural norm to favor men in positions of power and women in subservient roles. I was like, I don't know, it sounds like a woman wrote that, but I was really impressed with them saying, this is our problem. We know that this is what our problem is. Now they were bringing in our group to actually look at their practices. They wanted us to look at um, they are their hiring practices. They wanted us to look at tradition, I'm sorry, not tradition, hiring practices, promotions, pay, incidents of discrimination, uh, EPL claims. They wanted us to look at all that stuff. Um, and then they wanted us to create an action plan for them and then give them recommendations. And so we did that. Like we did all of that. We went through, you know, all of this quantitative data. Mind you, we did not talk to any of the staff. We just went through all the quantitative data. Uh, we came up with a generalized plan. We gave them the recommendations and gave them a report. And, and so we were done. Um, so you might be wondering, did the EPL claims decrease? Did their lawsuits decrease? And the answer to that question is no, they did not. So nothing, and so they had to bring us back in. They were saying, well, this didn't work what you gave us. So we need to bring you back in. So some of my folks that were on the team weren't available. I went in with another gentleman who had also studied appreciative inquiry with me. And we decided that we were gonna try to get fired that day. We were just gonna go ahead and just lay it out. We we're gonna talk about appreciative inquiry and just tell them, look, you tried this problem solving this way. Do you wanna try this other way of, of maybe getting this done? Um, and so it was very confusing to them um, as to why we were asking them about a positive core when it was very obvious that they actually wasn't, they weren't doing things right. right. So we had to explain to them, and I'm going to explain to you kind of how we walk them through this whole process. It really is revolutionary for anything that has to do with DEI, uh, only because focusing on moments of excellence. Um, many people think that, that they don't have any moments of excellence. Uh, what they have is rather failures, uh, and they focus on those failures uh, instead of those moments of excellence. So we had to try to show them that. Now, first of all, our, our efforts began with discovery. So during this time of the phase of appreciative inquiry, efforts are focused on understanding current strengths and exceptional moments through discussions and feedback. Uh, the positive core is revealed, uh, providing a foundation for future development, if you will. So what did I talk to them about? Um, so I talked to them about, this is leadership team first. 
I talk to them about who are the people, what people in your organization can positive, positively affect this, this work. Uh, why and what are their characteristics? They started naming all these people like, well, I mean, we have informal leaders, we have other stakeholders, we have positive de deviants, we, we, we have, and they just named them, just mentors, we have sponsors, they named all these people. Now, mind you, when we first went in there, we didn't talk to any of these people. We talked to zero. We didn't, we didn't talk to any of those people at all, right? But they named all these folks that we, that we should talk to and that we should include. We asked them, are there certain teams within your organization that have more women than other teams and are more diverse than other teams? Well, yeah, you know, this team over here and that team over there. Okay, we'd like to talk to them. When we did talk to them, we asked them, you know, what are your, what, what why do you have more women on your team? Why do you have, uh, and then we got all these wonderful, all this wonderful information, right, from these particular folks that we were talking to. We asked them about the, the performance. Uh, what teams within the organization that have the most diversity or perform the best? We'd like to talk to them. So in talking to the, the people, uh, looking at the places where their best performance occurred, uh, looking at the performance itself, um, asking them what, how you are proud of something. Tell us what you are proud of. We gathered all this information from the people that we spoke to. Remember, we didn't speak to them beforehand. We were looking at uh, numbers, uh, lots of, uh, and there's a place for quantitative data. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying to put that quantitative data into context, you actually need qualitative data, right? You need both of those. It needs to be a good marriage between the two. So when we talked to folks, we, they talked about how people were kind, how some folks felt safe to talk about different things that have to do with gender equity and, and equality. Um, they had affinity groups. They had market lead. They were, were actually the market leader. Um, they had mentors. They had sponsors. They had positive deviants. They were constantly raising their hands and telling them, look, we, you know, you guys need to hire more women and more women need to be leaders and more women need to be managed. They had all those positive resources that they could use to push forward this whole diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. And for them, um, really having more to do with gender, they had all these things sitting right there. It was a gold mine, a literal gold mine of all these positive things that they had going for them that they had not considered because they totally focused on the negative. So I want you to think about this while I drink this water. <laughs> this is one thing that we asked them. If you had three wishes at any of these groups that we talked to, one of the questions we asked them was, if you had three wishes for your organization, what would it be? And I want you to think about that for a minute. The positive things that you know that you're, you would like for your organization as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just think about it for just a minute. And we got some wonderful answers. Like I wish that there were more sponsors because we don't just need mentors, Joanne. We need people who are taking our names all the way up to the executive leadership, all the way up to the board. We need sponsors. A lot of the men here where we work have sponsors and the women do not. So I wish our organization uh, was really equal in terms of giving people the opportunity to become the, their best selves. So these were really in-depth conversations. People took this very seriously. And of course, you know, I was writing furiously uh, because we were going to give our recommendations based on some of the things that they were saying. So after this particular state, after we do discovery, then we do what we call a dream state. After the positive core is unveiled, and I told you about all the positive things that they had going on at their organization, the discussion moves to the possibility of spreading the discovered strengths within this organization, um, a vision of the future, if you will. Uh, what is it that we think that we want to be? We, so we mine this data for themes, identify topics that we wanted to work on so that we can really construct this future that they wanted. So. We ask these questions. What is the world or society calling for your organization to be? What are the most 
enlivening and exciting possibilities for your organization? And then what is the inspiration that is supporting your organization? So I want to go back to the church because the church group that brought us in, I didn't even know why I was there, to be honest with you. I was like, this is the church. I think you guys can just pray and figure this out. But anyway, so they bring me into the church and they're saying that they have a board and the board in the church has not been able to come to any kind of conclusions and decisions for over a month because there's constant arguing. And so, and, and, and that's not my thing. So I'm wondering why I'm there, but they sent me. So here I'm, I'm here because we're insuring this church. And I had, again, just taken this appreciative inquiry class. So one thing that I asked them was, what is the community wanting from you? Can we talk about that? And they had already sent me two pages of things that were wrong with everybody else and with the board in general, right? So I put that aside and I said, if you wanna go back to that, we'll go back to that. But can I just try something a little bit different? Would you mind that? And they said, okay, we'll try that, but don't forget you have all these pages of things that are wrong. So I wanted to know from them, what is expected of you? So what they told me was that, well, the community expects us to be prayerful, to, to provide healing, to provide comfort. Okay, all right. And what are the most just the exciting possibilities that you have for your organization? Well, that's what we want to do. We want to help people who, who need help. There's a lot of crime here in the, in the um, lower income areas. We want to help those folks. Uh, we, we want to help uh, the homeless. They have this whole list. They even wanted like an, this overseas ministry. But what their meetings guys had come down to was arguing about the carpet, arguing about pews. Um, they were on their third minister. Just, it was just this constant arguing about these things. I'm not saying they weren't important, but these things that were aside from their true mission, what they really had in their hearts, uh, their heart of hearts, what they really had. And one thing that I did ask them about was, can you tell me about a meeting that you've had that you felt was a great meeting? Can you tell me about that? Okay, and they started talking to me about someone had gotten um, shot. It was this really bad crime wave that had gone on. There was this one particular family that didn't have enough money to bury their loved one. And so they came together in a special meeting to raise funds to help with the funeral. And they thought that that was the most touching, um, most exciting in terms of what they have to offer the community meeting that they had ever had. And I asked them, how did that make you feel? What made us feel alive? It made us feel needed. It, it made us feel like we were doing what we were supposed to do. So I told them, those are the kind of meetings that we're headed toward. That's the kind of meetings that we want. And what we're getting ready to figure out is how we get there. So you think about what are the most enlivening, exciting possibilities you have in your mind about your organization? See it, really see it in your mind. Like, where do you want your organization to go in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I want you to be bold, not just to think about things in terms of we have the training or uh, trying to, uh, you know, stay away from people who are, you know, speaking against it or what have you. And, and they don't want, I don't think this is this, or I don't think you are going to surround yourself with positivity. And I want you just to think for just one second about an enlivening and an exciting possibility as far as DEI is concerned and your own organization. So then we started the planning stage afterwards, after we had co-created this dream. Um, and this is about the shared image. Um, I told you I talked to the church group again about their particular meetings and which meetings have been most successful. There was another uh, uh, way I talked to them about the meeting because they told me about what they had done for this family. But I said, I want you to use your five senses. I want you to tell me everything about the meeting that day. And it was looking at me like this lady's nuts. But anyway, they did it. I said, what do you smell? They said, chocolate chip cookies. It's a chocolate chip. Yeah, because Berna used to, that's not her name, but Bernadette used to bring uh, cookies all the time, but she she doesn't do that anymore. But she used to bring cookies all the time, and we would take turns with bringing the coffee or the milk or what have. Now, as they're talking to me, you see their whole body just soften, their whole countenance just soften as they talk about <laughs> chocolate chip cookies at this meeting. Then they started talking about 
um, you know, one of so and so is a police officer. He's not here anymore. He left the church, but he was telling us all about what had happened and and how the crime rate was going up. And we were all so concerned. And I said, well, "What did you do about that?" Well, we put together uh, a, a whole consortium. Of, like they started talking to me about cooperation. They started talking to me about how they respected each other's thoughts and processes. Like they just and to me, I didn't need to talk anymore. Because I could see them looking at each other and I could see them all coming together within this vision and within in this shared image of reality. And knowing that's what we got to get back to. That's what we got to get back to. So remember now, I had this two, three, four page, this, this, all these pages of what was wrong. But this story and talking about how it was when they were at their best is what pushed us forward into our planning stage. Because everything that we talked about then, that's what we wanted in our final stage. So I want you to think about for yourself, what does your successful self look like? Use as many of your senses as you possibly can because you really want a really good image. You want it to stick. What does your successful teams look like? What do they look like? What does your successful organization look like? Be bold in everything that you say. Be bold, but you can't expect perfection, Joanne. Look, we're dreaming and it's our dream. So be bold, be bold in everything that you're thinking about in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion for your organization. And even the things that you have for yourself, the things that you wanna learn and do for yourself that are related. So the final stage was to initiate the steps. Um, from the design space. So after we created this particular vision for both the church and this industrial company, we created the vision of this is the reality that we want at work, right? Then we looked at how can we get there? How can we get there? There's no, I don't need to, and we don't, we didn't write up a big report or anything like that. We actually wrote out and sketched out an action plan um, talked about how, because uh, mentors were a huge thing for them. We also talked to executive leadership. And let me just go to the next slide because folks think that you have to do this big, uh, very difficult framework. But this is what the, uh, the folks at the uh, industrial company did. They talked about what the individual people were going to do. So training was included in that, right, for awareness. Training was included in that. But they also uh, came up with a code of conduct uh, that they wanted everybody to treat people respectfully. Right. Um, so they talked about that and pushed that about their joyful environment that they were going to create for everyone. Right. And what they were going to tolerate and not tolerate. Right. And then they talked about their teams. I like this part because the teams actually they didn't have to have a, a, a DEI um, a strategy or a goal or anything like that. But for teams who did, leadership really highlighted them. They, they really told everybody, they were like on their website, you could see stories about these particular teams and how they increased the amount of women that were on their teams and how they have special projects and how they're coming up with special products. It really was kind of pushed up there all the way to the top whenever a team decided that they were going to do something in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The team decided what their vision was going to be for their particular team and how they wanted it to be in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I give them a gold star for that. They didn't say you had to do it. They just made sure that the people who did do it uh, really, really got accolades. Then the organization itself decided that they were going to have an annual strategy, an annual metric or metrics in general about DEI and how they were going to do it. And, and I thought, you know, them coming up with these smart metrics uh, really put them in a, in a position of accountability for what it is that they said that they were going to do. One question they had for me was, well, Joanne, if it doesn't work, do we still have to tell the employees? Or uh, Absolutely. So many organizations make this huge mistake. Uh, they do engagement surveys and culture surveys, and they never tell their employees the results. They never tell them what happened. When you do that, your employees think, I told you something was wrong and you didn't do anything. You didn't even care enough to come back and tell me uh, what was actually said in the report. And you can expect that the next time that you put out an engagement survey or a culture survey, uh, you're not gonna have a lot of participation. 
So we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot when we do that. I think employees or no, from talking to employees, they're more impressed when you tell them that I know that something's wrong and here's that information. And I want to hear from you as to what we can, you know, what we can do to make this better. This is what we've come up with, but we'd also like to hear from you, right? Not something that we've done per se in the past from a traditional standpoint, right? It was for us to know and for them to find out, but we shouldn't be doing that. We actually should tell them they need to be able to co-create this vision, co-create this environment as we move forward.